Travis, welcome to Nova Scribes. Over to you. All right. <clears throat> thank you, Brian. And thank you all uh, for being generous with your time. I like raised my hand kind of like this. This is my first time at Nova Scribes because I've watched several of the recordings, but this is my first live session with you all. And I met Brian through a mutual friend that I think we both think really fond of. And uh, Brian was really, this was probably a couple of years ago, pre-COVID. And um, and so Brian was really generous. I was really curious about visual uh, facilitation. And I almost introduced myself today as a complete outsider and almost like wanted to be, uh, I don't know, um, like deferential to you all and say, I'm not a visual facilitator. But part of what I hope comes out of our conversation tonight is that I, um, and I hope you all agree with this in some ways, is that this practice of like visual facilitation broadly, um, whether you are uh, expert and really skilled, as I can see somebody's uh, Mary Jo, very like Im impressive background there. Um, I am envious if you have some real skill. What I wanna talk about tonight is ways that we can make uh, what we do really democratic. And the first time I met Brian, uh, even two years ago, it stuck with me that I think your instincts were like, no, trust me, lots and lots of people can do this. Um, and so I'm believing in that. And actually in preparing for tonight, um, you know, it encouraged me even more. So I hope tonight is like the beginning of something even new for me and my own toolkit in my practice. Um, but more than that, I am really, I said this to the, the folks that were on a minute or two ago, um, I hope you showed up ready for a conversation um, tonight. Um, part of the way I, I see myself like embracing this um, kind of scribing uh, visual facilitator in me is um, moving away from a lot of the practices that have caused my own burnout um, in my in my like career as a facilitator. And maybe we'll get into some of that um, today, which is obviously um, going to be both personal and professional of why I decided to couch what you might think of as just another methodology. Visual, visual facilitation and its relationship to something like our mental and spiritual and psychological and physical well-being, right? That's kind of the, the task when Brian asked, like, would you want to facilitate? Um, some of the stuff I've been reading, which I'm going to share with you tonight, uh, was just too coincidental for me to say no. I was like, I think I'm tapping into some interesting stuff that I really hope you all find um, useful. But more than that, I'm, I'm really curious the connections that you might make and your own expertise as real life practitioners. I'm like a fake it till you make it or I wanna be like in your seat one day. I'm on the beginning of my journey of, of visual facilitation. Um, and so I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing from you all uh, as much as I am I'm sharing with you tonight. So I am gonna do, um, because it's such a short session, I'm going to kind of skip a lot of my story and bio, that kind of thing. But I never want to skip an opportunity for us to at least a little bit do some kind of quick intros to get some of your kind of human energy and, and uh, your personhood into the session. So uh, that's what I want to do first. And I um, could reconnect with Brian several weeks ago, and I, I told him that uh, I bought a Remarkable 2 e-ink um, tablet, which I'm all excited about. And he was like, oh, really cool. You know, uh, have you done the screen sharing feature with it yet? I have not, but tonight we're going to see how it goes. So this is also like a, a trial run. Um, so... I've got my Remarkable up. And then if you all, um, I asked Brian about this, what was the best way technology wise? And I was thinking there was gonna be another app, another software, something for us to do some drawing tonight and how to share that. And I was so thrilled that he said like, old school, we just show it up you know, on the, on the webcam kind of thing. So excellent. So if you wanna, if you don't already, um, something to write with, um, some paper or whatever other technology that you'll be able to share with the group. Uh, if you'll kind of get that handy, I will be screen sharing with the Remarkable as we go. And so I'll probably be doing several kind of back and forth of my screen sharing. And then, um, uh, well, you still should be able to, to share what you're drawing, even with my screen sharing up. But we'll see how this goes. Yep. Okay. So... 
Let me get situated here. And I've got a prompt. to hopefully get us started. All right, you see my screen all right? Okay, so here's how I thought we would do intros and then hopefully kind of a launch into um, some of the research that I've been kind of swimming in that I told you I kind of light bulbs went off and I thought hopefully some of this stuff might be useful for you all. And I also figured, you know, if worse comes to worse, and this is like all old news to you all or something, um, I've got lots of resources that I want to share with you. Um, so I've got a stack of books here. So at least you get what I think are some really useful resources, uh, if anything else. So as a way to kind of bring yourself into the session uh, and to begin our conversation around this very bold claim, I kind of laughed at myself about this description of clean lines save lives. Um, hopefully that doesn't land on you as too like consulty -y or, or idealistic um, because I wanna start our conversation thinking about lines both literally and figuratively in lots of different ways. In fact, as we go in our session, I hope in our conversation, you keep thinking, are we talking about actual lines or lines of movement, lines of flight, lines of feeling, right? Line, people as lines. Um, and so before I say more, I'll kind of say where some of this is coming from, this very simple question, what are lines? But I thought one way that we might get at that is, um, just, and you can take this whatever direction you want, but I want to, I want to invite you to maybe take a couple of minutes. So I'll, I'll kind of do a, a real loose stopwatch here and give you two minutes. And then you all can tell me if you need a little more time. And I want you to, to draw a line or lines that reflects how you are entering the session. So a single line or multiple lines. And I underlined you here because you, all of us, we are a complicated, complex bundle of lines. Again, figuratively and literally from, you know, the cells in our body, our nervous systems, our neurons, the lines in our muscles. Um, you might think of how you in this moment are feeling, what are the lines in your body and in your mind, if you had to map them for us on a Thursday evening, or you as kind of an average of the lines that maybe you've been experiencing in the last several weeks or maybe months or years. Um, you know, whatever collection of you you wanna share with us tonight, um, there's no pressure to take this any particular direction with any kind of depth. Uh, I, my background is in diversity and inclusion work, and I'm, I'm going to shut up here in just a second, but we do a lot of humanistic practices, and it seems like this is the culture of Nova Scribes as well, which is why I love what, what you all are doing here. Um, but these are heavy times for lots of us, right? Um, I, I don't want to ignore what's going on in the world right now with Ukraine and Russia and with the pandemic and all that you might be carrying and juggling. And so it's okay if your lines are not uh, you know, um, you know, fitting some ideal, right? And so all lines are acceptable. Um, so feel free to um, take this with every direction. So take two minutes. All right. <clears throat> Would anyone like a little more time? I'm just going to scan for a uh, Some feedback here, raising hands, anybody? Okay. And uh, why don't we limit this to maybe, you know, 30 seconds to a minute or so in your, in your intro, um, you know, more or less, just so everybody has an opportunity to share. And by the way, this is like totally pressure off if, um, if, uh, if you don't wanna share and maybe nothing came to you in terms of lines, um, just kind of your name for the group will work. 
And I will just ask, does anybody want to break the ice and kick us off? And, uh, uh, and be willing to share your lines with us. I'm happy to go first. All right. Thank you, Brian. So let's see, share my lines. Um, so I wanted to do something that was uh, a little bit more energetic. Um, I feel like in general, I'm moving in, a, in straight lines, um, but it's not always constant. And uh, I, this is one of my favorite lines is uh, something called an architect's line where you sort of drag your pen across a page and then stop and then start and then stop and then start. And so I sort of staggered my lines across because I feel like um, it, it may not be exactly as straight as I'm going, but at least I'm headed in the right direction. Excellent. All right, who's next? This is Joe. Um, I don't know if you can see this because I'm not seeing my own screen right now. Oh, there we go. Um, I'm thinking of a line, me walking on it, and I'm hoping that tonight I get some ideas about you know going upward. But then I thought, um, more like a kite, you know how the wind makes lines and it's kind of like whichever way it's gonna go, it's, that's where it's gonna take me. So it's gonna be a mix of those two things. Very cool. I love that. Who else? I can go though. I don't feel I might have to unblur. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, it's blurred a little bit. Here, why don't you move on to while I okay. unblur? All right, somebody else. I will go. It's a <laughs> very simple. It's a, a straight line. Mm -hmm. um, I'm usually very straightforward, simple, and um, I'm waiting for the next next instruction. Excellent, thank you. All right, I'll jump back in since I'm. So here's my line, and uh, I've started with this is how I came into the session because I had a stressful day at work. <laughs> and thought, ah, do I even have time to attend the session? And then I thought this, these lines will save my life. And so now I'm gradually kind of like calming and being more positive. I love that. Yeah. And I, what is that? What does anybody know? What's the machine called that like measures your, uh, was it your blood pressure? E ectogram, the a cardio yeah. ectogram, something like that. Yeah, exactly. I thought about that in preparation in terms of like how lines show up even in measuring our, uh, you know, uh, our health. Electrocardiogram. There we go. <laughs> so I'll go. So I had, I'm Nancy Heyer. I had a really amazing day with a, just an, uh, just a fabulous event. And then, but I'm not sure what's next. So I've got all these uh, arrows out here in different directions because I don't know what's next. And those are my lines. Very cool. All right, anybody else? I can go. Uh, my name is Annalise, uh, you should hear pronouns. And um, this is my first, uh, I just discovered no scribes recently. So, uh, it's great to be here. Um, my, let's see, my line is also relatively simple. Um, and it's just sort of a little swirly on the ground and some swirly going up. And um, yeah, I've been working from home today. So kind of like staying in the same place, but I have a lot of uh, things that I feel like are pulling me in other directions that I would rather be doing. <laughs> um, and also just like curiosity and excitement about um, things that are going on and, and learning um, in this session and elsewhere. Excellent, thank you. Who else would like to share? I'll go. Um, can you see it? Mm -hmm. um, just a lot of squiggles. It starts out, you know, you, it's a busy day. So you kind of start out and then you go out, you know, you do different things. Some things are not so great and other things are. Um, and sometimes I just feel like I get caught in rabbit holes um, or feel extremely ADD. So it's not a nice straight line. It's kind of all over the place. 
Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. All right, anybody else? Hi, Travis. I'm Yuli. Hey. Thanks so much for putting this session together. Um, so uh, my squiggles are pretty similar to uh, the previous one. And uh, I'm playing with this fun new tool that I have. And uh, I don't really have words for the emotion or the present experience, but uh, sometimes images capture an experience better than words can. So I appreciate this opportunity to just kind of share our lines. Yeah, no, that, that's perfect. And um, we'll definitely kind of relay into where we're going next. Appreciate that. Anybody else? And does anybody else, if you don't have lines, do you want to um, do a quick like intro before I move on? I'll do a quick intro. I'm Heather and I did draw some lines, but I feel very similar to Yili that I don't think that I have some words to go with it. I just want to share it. Excellent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, anybody else? I don't want to make sure I don't miss anybody. Okay, so um, thank you all. I'll go ahead and like share one resource before I move on. And uh, like I said, I've, uh, this is a little bit of like a stepping out for me because typically um, I've been doing like pretty traditional kind of PowerPoint, pretty content heavy, you know, facilitation when I part partner with other folks. And uh, one of the things I love about visual facilitation is it's what I, cons I would consider a risky pedagogy in the sense that as a facilitator, you really do have to trust the wisdom of the, of the group. And so um, one of the things I wanted to kind of share with you all and to get your like thinking, and you might already be kind of on this track, is um, what, and I, I love the last intros about, I didn't necessarily have words to put with my lines. So um, I'm curious if anybody is familiar or seen this, uh, it's, um, the book is just called Lines. And it's by Tim Ingold. He is kind of one of the leading like anthropologists. And basically he had this question that I have up here, what are lines? And he basically says that this book is really the only kind of the, the text out there and a philosophy of lines. And this is kind of what I had been reading when Brian and I reconnected. And it's fascinating. The line that I've drawn is somewhat of a representation of what I've been dealing with in the last couple of years, which I didn't always have the language for. We're gonna talk about this in our, our, the rest of our time together. Um, and now I know it was burnout, which is like, we use that pretty colloquially and is, there's a whole lot of science and research and models that burnout is an actual thing that um, describes an experience in the world. And we describe it when we say things like we are spinning our wheels. Um, I really appreciated, I think it was um, maybe Mary who said, uh, you know, you get, um, uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth, like distracted and, and uh, I am totally kind of experiencing that in many ways for the first time or in some very new ways that are unsettling for me. In fact, Brian said subscribe to my newsletter, which was totally on my agenda to get launched before this week, and it is not yet, but it will be next week if you're curious about following along with my work. But I've been experiencing some real deep burnout, which is why my, my lines are kind of going in circles here. But right at the end, I, I kind of made a, a line out because I've had some breakthroughs um, pretty recently of just kind of having some more clarity on the direction of my work and, and drawing lines around kind of the, there's lines again, around what I can and can't control. And, um, and so I appreciate those of you that were like willing to be vulnerable about even your messy lines. Um, so I wanted to have a conversation next about um, what lines 
uh, R. Let me kind of bring this back. And I, I'm curious to hear from you all before I kind of bring up some, some additional notes. Um, what, I mean, just from that simple prompt of what kind of lines describe kind of where you are, it didn't take a whole lot of nudging for you all to kind of go different directions with that, which is, which is what I think is interesting. And by the way, this book is like a part one. Tim Ingold has a, a newer book where he kind of do dove even deeper into the philosophy, the symbol of what lines mean, where they show up in history. There's some fascinating examples of indigenous cultures that, you know, uh, way before there was script and text, there were lines, even lines in the sand as some of our like early human gestures. Um, and he's got an updated book that's, uh, I, I forget the title, you can look it up, but um, it's an academic book. So it's a little more pricey than I wanted to buy before this session, but I'll probably end up getting it at some point. Um, but anyway, he's, he's just got me really excited to think about what are lines. Um, let me actually, because of time here, let me do this. So you all tell me, um, and if there's any, any people that are like, uh, musically trained, you might know exactly what note this is. Let me make that a little bigger, actually. Anybody know what note that is? Um, tell me what comes to mind when you when you think about the difference between these lines that I just drew, this uh, musical note here, and uh, these lines. So what are these are these are both two sets of of lines, but what do they do for you as the interpreter or the reader? Where does your mind go? What do these lines want from you? What do they pull out of you? What I'm thinking right off the bat is that uh, the, the word truth, lines used that way, are going to get me thinking about a concept, an idea, and I'm going to have lots more words around that. Whereas the, the musical note is like, I, I don't know what that's like. I'd love to hear what that note is, but I don't have anything to say about it. I'm just like waiting. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's great. Anybody else? I feel like they evoke or enlighten different parts of the brain and one feels more intellectual versus the note feels more kind of emotional um, sensation. Even though I don't know what note that is, I, I can hear a note in my head. Very cool. Yeah, I love that connection with kind of the left brain, uh, right brain. I, I didn't even intend that. But that's That's great. Somebody else? I think one is symbolic and one is um, a word. So mm -hmm. it's giving you di two different ways of using lines. Yeah, that's, that's excellent. Any, anybody else? So I thought this would be a good starting place for us to um, kind of think about initially what lines are versus lines that are put together um, that become texts. And so if you think about it, this musical note, the job of the musical note is not done yet. In fact, this is an invitation for people that can read music to then perform this note with their voice or their instrument and that performance of the line is actually the work, right? That's what this line is just a beginning. The musical note is a notation. 
truth. And I, I intentionally chose this here because it's like pretty idealistic. And of course, now we're living in this like post-fact, post-truth era where all kinds of people are competing for the truth. Um, it is imposed in some way. So I think uh, Joe said, you know, it made you think about a concept, right? So it's these lines are already telling you what the meaning is. The lines are their job, their work is done. Um, and so I got some of this from like Tim Ingle, but if you want another book that I, is kind of a classic in anthropology, it's called The Spell of the Sensuous. And it's all about the history of how we moved very slowly from lines as notations, lines as invitations, uh, uh, in the same way that musical notes are invitations for groups of people to then uh, vocalize or give meaning to um, various texts or lines, right? And then the long history ends up with the, the printing press to eventually now the world that we live in where we are bombarded with concepts and texts. And uh, even when we handwrite is already like a step removed from like early notations. Let me see if uh, I left room here for, for some of these notes. So um, I'm curious if you'd add to this list, but I wanted to start out by defining lines as what they do and not necessarily what they are, right? Lines are invitations. Um, they are symbols and they're democratic um, more than kind of text. Um, this came out in some of your in, um, some of your introductions about drawing lines, how you're showing up. Um, I think it was Joe who drew the kite, right? We use lines for movement. Um, they we use lines when we talk about trails and maps and roads, and so we think about lines as unfinished. They are pointers to things on the go, ideas on the go. Um, I love that several of you said, well, I've got some lines that I know are reflections of how I am right now. Um, because one of the things that we lose when we type in letters and words and texts is the bodies that are coming up with those ideas, right? If all of us are typing on keyboards, um, we are erasing the authors of those texts, right? I mean, we can be interpreters of the, the words, but there's no escaping that each of us has our own unique signature, our own style. I've got this like pretty horrible handwriting, I apologize for, but it is reflective of me. And in the same way, our lines are reflective of who we are, right? Not just our ideas, but our feelings. Um, and so I just wrote kind of some, you know, scribing as notation is the long history that now we are a part of, which I think is pretty fascinating. And um, the real work is the set of performances. You might think about your workshops as kind of orchestras where you all are inviting people to chime in with their lines. Um, scribing together is democratic, it's constructive, it's open-ended. It encourages deep listening and exploration. And so um, meaning making or communication the way that our minds are wired, and this is why virtual you know, learning is so challenging, is that we lose some of the, the stuff that we don't always take seriously, like our literal face-to-face -face presence and the way that we pick up on all kinds of cues uh, that are sometimes lost in the mediated you know, kind of virtual platform. Um, what other thoughts do you have here in terms of what lines are, this kind of big philosophical question or what they do. I'm just seeing the chat. I can use all the help I can get with the <laughs> handwriting. I told you this is the beginning of my journey. I think sometimes, um, well, one, they can convey information, not necessarily via like concepts, but just like where to go, I guess, kind of like a, on a map, but just think about like lines on roads, like sometimes they're boundaries, sometimes they're paths or, um, you know, lanes, or sometimes they're, they're just for like visual um, aesthetics or, um, 
you know, a little bit more abstract meaning. I'm also a dancer. So like a lot of times lines are, is a term that you use in, in like movement performance as well. You say someone has good lines, it means their legs are straight, their toes are pointed, or they like are able to make very intentional um, shapes and, um, and like formations or images, if you will, uh, with their bodies. Very cool. Anybody else? And what if lines would be able to reach from one another? Mm. And for me, before the note and the true, for me, it's the same. It's that it's only a different expression. So as people, we are different. Mm -hmm. So we have different expression, different understanding, but it doesn't mean we are different. Mm -hmm. But we do, we are different. Mm -hmm. And our difference is our richness. Mm -hmm. So the note is, this note is a rhythm. It's not a specific note. Mm. but it's a rhythm so as human we also have different rhythm personal and you and i and others so how do we connect is it with a straight line is it with a line like this is it with a line like that mm -hmm. how do we connect yeah, I love that. I mean, it's it's cliche, but I don't know. We've got to fight to make these like beautiful things in the world that we've cheapened like alive again. But, you know, all of us have a unique fingerprint. These lines that mark us in the world that no other human being in the world has. Right. It's incredible. Um, both of those examples you all just listed show up in this um, philosophy of lines book. Some of the early ways that lines were used were to trace um, family trees or heritage. Right. Um, but Interestingly, initially, family trees or, or um, these family lines started from the roots up was the way kind of lots of indigenous cultures traced lineages. Um, and there's like an interesting story of how it became kind of the tree down. Um, but I thought about another icebreaker, and I'm going to use this at, at some point with a group, is to ask people to maybe trace some part of their line as a way to tell their story in life. Um, I do a lot of that kind of who are you in the world thing where we invite people to kind of tell their cultural story, you know, to your, to your point about how we are all uniquely different. We've all been shaped in the world, paths and roads and trails that we've walked on. And I think it'd be really interesting if you put a lot of people together and what their different lines, you know, might look like. Um, anybody else here before we move on? So essentially what I wanted to do is just spend some time like building the complexity that lines are these incredibly deep things that are pointers that we should take, you know, seriously um, before we get to some of the, the wellness stuff. And I see Nancy. Yeah. Now, I was just going to comment that when you first introduced this idea of what is a line, the first thing that came to my mind was that lines have the power to both connect us, but also to separate us. They serve as dividers, but they also serve as connectors. So it very much depends on the, context and the interpretation. I love that. Yeah, borders are, are lines, right? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I don't know, isn't it true in a lot of our spaces, professional spaces, we tend to err on the side of kind of the positive light of things, but lines can be violent, right? They can be dis disconnections. Thank you for that. Anybody else? All right, so I want to have another conversation between um, this clean lines versus what I'm uh, kind of been thinking about as toxic texts. And I'm thinking here about the long history of how we started with lines as invitations, notations, lines of connection, uh, lines as stories to the world that we live in where, where we are literally more than any other like human group in history bombarded with texts. Um, there's all kinds of like interesting stats on there about how many words people read on average. Um, and I almost like uh, emailed Brian and said, I don't know about the clean lines thing, because I love that you brought up that one of your favorite lines were these architect lines. 
And uh, straight lines get kind of like beat up a little bit in this book. It's like interesting how straight and geometrical clean lines um, played some role in history of who got to be experts in lines and who did it, right? I almost like wanted to change it to squiggly lines or something. Um, but somebody's, somebody who registered for this session, who I don't think is on here, her name was uh, Andrea or Andrea. And I can't find her bio, but her bio showed up in my email and it said clean language in her bio. So I wanted to give her a shout out because I was not familiar with this like whole body of work and philosophy around clean language. But that totally like was serendipitous that I, that I thought about the language of clean lines initially. Um, it, unless anybody else wants to speak up, if you're familiar with that, I already ordered a book on, on um, clean language. And that's essentially exactly where I was thinking about the role that lines could play as something like a wellness intervention, right? And the, the general idea is that clean in the sense of erasing the preconceived metaphors, uh, and it's, it comes out of like therapy and clinical psychology, but basically the danger of therapists and counselors and medical professionals imposing their lines or their narrative on people's um, traumas or their struggles, right? So the idea of clean language is practices and questions um, to get people to come up with their own story, their own metaphor, their own language to describe their traumas or um, you know, mental illness or something. And I thought, well, that's exactly what I was kind of thinking about what clean lines can do, what the role of visual facilitators even in a workshop the role that we might offer to people to come up with their own insights, right? Their own metaphors, their own stories, their own language. Um, and I, I just increasingly think this is important and it, it, it I think affects a lot of what um, we're seeing in some of the mental health, um, I mean, I would call them like epidemics. I mean, the rates of, depression and anxiety and stress. And I've already shared a bit about um, burnout that shapes um, not just uh, our lives outside of work, but our lives in work. Um, does anyone know what uh, these lines are? What, is, what does this bring into your mind? Does anybody know what these lines are? Saying, doing, reflecting. Letters, you... Hebrew letters. Yeah. Who said that? Nancy. Yeah, th this is Hebrew, right? So if you've never seen, um, you know, kind of a original Hebrew, I took some Hebrew uh, in university as part of my philosophy undergrad. So I haven't thought about Hebrew in a long time. But if you're familiar with the Hebrew language, um, originally, there were no vowels, right? So a lot of the these lines that you see here, um, the vowels came much later from the consonants, and there's a long history of, um, of uh, vowels not being added because Hebrew was one of those first languages that introduced an alphabet as a symbolic system to, um, to reference meaning in the world. I mean, there are a lot of other languages that are um, where the letters and words are pictures, right? So they're image languages. And uh, what's unique about Hebrew is it's kind of this um, hybrid of symbols, referencing concepts, um, but uh, there's a long history of uh, different rabbis and rabbinic traditions that interpret um, multiple meanings with the same text. And there's... It's, yeah, it's fun. I'm sorry, Travis, because for me, this that it looks the way you draw it. It looks like a start of a drawing of a head with two eyes. <laughs> yeah, see, it's even open for like <laughs> non-Hebrew interpretations. Um, and the but the significance of the vowels is that um, the spirit and the word of God in in Jewish texts. Um, is not just uh, kind of in addition to the language, the breathing through the words and vowels are a way to add sound to breath, right? Which I think there's a connection here between what it is that we're doing when we are scribing 
and I'm totally making a false dichotomy here, but this is supposed to be a picture of a PowerPoint. And um, I, I have like an unhealthy relationship with PowerPoint at this point <laughs> in my life because I, I told you that I'm experiencing some real deep burnout. I, I even almost made a PowerPoint for this presentation. So don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with PowerPoint, but I do think PowerPoint is symbolic of something much larger in the way that we learn together and the role that information and concepts and texts are playing out in our, in our everyday lives. Um, so I'm just curious from you, I mean, PowerPoint as a technology, as a kind of line, um, what does it invoke from us as learners? What does PowerPoint encourage? What kind of thinking, what kind of learning, what kind of participation? Well, I think the way that most people use PowerPoint is that it tends to be fairly frontal. Um, so you think about like the sage on the stage, it tends to be didactic. Um, you put participants into passive receive mode um, and the flow of communication tends to be one way. Um, so you have the presenter projecting forward, mm -hmm. seeing a thumbs up from Nancy and Joe on that one. <laughs> Yep. I, I figured this would be like a, a touch point for you all. Anybody have anything to add there? What Brian said? I mean, that's exactly kind of what I was thinking. So if you're not already familiar, there's a lot. I mean, we keep using PowerPoint despite lots and lots of studies now about its you know, pros and cons. And there's a lot more cons, I think, than pros. But there's, of course, creative ways to use something like PowerPoint. So I didn't want to beat up on PowerPoint too much, but I think Brian's exactly right. I mean, the research says even when we see pre-scripted bullets and content, parts of our brains even shut down, right? I mean, it's a top-down technology. Um, and it, you know, it might have its uses for certain kinds of learning. Um, but the reason I put the hashtag here is because there's a, um, a lot of folks that I think are on the cutting edge right now, just thinking about the, what technology and our overabundance of words is doing to us mentally and psychologically, right? So even the hashtag is a way to have a global conversation about a single concept. And I put Nova here because I, I love this community as kind of an outsider and, and hopefully I'll, I'll be like more engaged going forward. But you know, if, if, and oh, by the way, I think I might have told you this, Brian. My daughter's name is Nova. I'm a new dad. I've got a two-year-old named Nova. Um, and you know, if if like Nova became a Nova Scribes became a hashtag, and millions and millions of people were using it, and there was Nova T-shirts and Nova coffee mugs, and you know, we were bombarded with like Nova all the time, it would start to lose its novelty, right? Um, and that's why I chose Truth as the initial text because. I think we cheapen what uh, is one of the most beautiful things about us as human beings, our ability to think and to embrace complexity and to have dialogue and to share stories. Um, and we have created an entire industry and technologies that are doing our thinking for us. Um, and so I, I see like our time here. So I wanna get to like some um, real connections to wellness here. Um, I wanted to have a conversation, which maybe I'll, I'll kind of do the last like thoughts here together about what is the difference between scribing, visual facilitating, creating experiences where people have opportunities to um, share lines or create their own lines as invitations to their experiences, their life paths, their stories versus scripted. Um, learnings all the way down from like a single workshop that is really content heavy from, you know, as Brian said, there's even like a hierarchy usually kind of embodied in a lot of like learning um, practices, but even globally, the way that, you know, uh, if you just think about Twitter, for example, 10 percent, like 2% of the users create 90 something percent of the content. Um, and so, you know, not all voices in the world are being heard equitably, right? Um, and so I will move on to kind of how this has showed up in, in, um, in my life in burnout and some of the, the kind of reading, thinking that I've been doing on burnout. 
and I'll, I'll share a couple of resources and then you all can kind of tell me what your norms on like hard stop here are, but I want to like give you all the, the final word. Um, but I think every, I'm, this is going to be like my new Bible for a while. It just came out. It's called the end of burnout. I signed up for, um, Jonathan Malezik's, uh, he does have a sub stack out. So I guess he got out of his burnout to get his sub stack. He's got a newsletter you can subscribe to. Um, I reached out to him on Twitter. He was kind of like really gracious. And he just said, you know, in our short exchange, he was going to like be updating some of his research and his talks. Um, but he basically defines burnout as the push and pull between our expectations or our ideals uh, and our reality. So at work, he says a lot of altruistic professions like teachers, healthcare workers, social workers, uh, people in you know, ministry, et cetera, probably lots of you that are drawn to work as a place where you do fulfilling things for yourself and for other people. But if that reality doesn't match up with your ideals, there is this constant kind of spinning. And I've been increasingly thinking about metaphors that would capture burnout. And one of them that comes to mind is a maze. And this is not totally original, but another book that I would recommend to you that has like been really insightful for me is called Well Grounded. It's a lot of neuroscience. And uh, this neuroscientist, Kelly Lambert, she uh, is kind of an expert. She wrote an entire book on the history of psychology using rats as um, you know, animals that have similar brain functions than, than humans. And rats have been put through mazes since like the 1950s or something. So there's all kinds of fascinating experiments about rats and mazes. And um, some of the experiments with mazes that she talks about totally describe my experience with burnout, uh, where you get in kind of repetitive, toxic routines, um, a lot of it is knowledge workers, quote unquote, that are working with ideas that eventually become kind of cheapened over time and lose their connection to what they once referenced. They lose their real life kind of um, vitality, if you will. Um, if we had more time, I was going to invite you all to maybe think about either mental illnesses that you're aware of personally or that you bump up into professionally and how you might illustrate them through lines. I was gonna draw a maze that has no ending. And a lot of times work can feel that way if, if you're doing the kinds of work that's hard to grasp how it's making a difference in the world, what kind of changes it, it is kind of attaching to. Um, or for folks like us where we're in a very wordy kind of profession, um, you know, it can be a challenge to see how our lines and our words are making some real difference, right? Or, or to that constant fight that our words remain alive and new. Um, and so I could, you know, I, I put this like real bold claims about clean lives, saving lives, but, and this is pretty like high theory um, on the ecological, uh, cause I, I know I made a connection in the description between personal burnout and the way that we are burning up our, our planet and our lives and our families, and a lot of it is burnout from work. Um, and so the, you know, if we take seriously that we are living beings on this living planet, not separated from the world, this kind of ecological view of who we are, our burnout is actually pretty similar to what's happening with climate change. I mean, if you think about burnout, the way I've been kind of trying to, de to define it is, it's an accumulation of energy without an exit. So there's the, the why I'm thinking about the maze. And that's exactly what we're doing with our planet, right? We're, we're polluting the atmosphere and we've destroyed all the ways that the earth naturally gets rid of energy. Um, and one more book I'd recommend to you is gonna be another Bible for me in this year as I've moved like to, to bring this work to larger groups around wellness is Dying for a Paycheck. Um, uh, Jeffrey Pfeiffer, he's got tons of research on there on how work is literally killing us um, and the planet that burnout at work doesn't just stay at work, it spills over and affects um, all kinds of 
relationships, addictions, depression, anxiety. He has a conservative estimate that burnout, workplace stress, depression, et cetera, you know, causes uh, 120,000 unnecessary deaths a year. And those aren't like estimates. Those are like pretty hot, like pretty significant models controlling for all kinds of things. Um, and so I, I just want, I know that was a lot and we were all over the place, but I think if we take seriously the way that people are, are being bombarded with information, juggling not only what's happening in the world, um, showing up in things like burnout, depression, anxiety, in historical numbers, um, I do think we both have small and big roles to play as people that use lines to bring clarity, to bring like democratic participation, um, to bring some renewed sense that everybody is a, a line that has some lines to share with the world. Uh, so I know we're right at time. Brian, you, you tell me here if like hard stop is pretty um, typical. I'm happy to stay on for any like additional thoughts, um, et cetera. Well, I, I'll tell you, how about we do this? We can go ahead and end the recording. Um, and if you don't mind hanging around for some office hours, I know I've got some questions that I'd like to ask and I don't think I'm the only one, but uh, how about we go ahead and give Travis a, a big Nova Scribes thank you. Yay. And I'll go ahead and stop the recording. Thank you so much. All right, thank you all.